You're listening to Speaking Sidemount, the podcast where we talk all things sidemount diving, from equipment, skills, techniques, and sidemount diving expeditions, to interviews with some of the world's top sidemount divers. Whether you're new to sidemount, been sidemount diving for years, or just want to know more, this is the place for all things sidemount. I'm your host, Steve Davis. Let's get wet. Know Mike for a long time and have a really close association with him. Tell us a bit about you know your relationship with Mike. Um, yeah, Mike and I were good friends. Um, he, you know, I was diving uh, his Kiss Jam prototype back in the two thousand eight or something, and I thought it was supposed to be a recreational uh, rebreather, but I thought I could turn it into a side mount rebreather would help with this big exploration I was doing that uh, had really tight restrictions. Mm -hmm. Um, And then later on the sidekick. And then when he gave me uh, the side winder to work on, he didn't even tell me what it was. He just called me and said, there's a new toy coming. And I said, (laughs) great, but what is it? He wouldn't even tell me. He said, it'll be in the mail. So when it got there, I looked at it and I went, what is this? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and looks like um, a couple of thermos flasks, right? <laughs> <laughs> so it, you know, I really had a lot of fun with that. Um, I, when I first got it, I thought, well, it looks interesting. It looks unique. I'm not going to dive it for what I do, but, uh, you know, I was happy with my sidewinder or my sidekick. So, um, but the more I dove it and the more, we did in developing it and got it really tight, really um, neatly slung. The work of breathing is phenomenal. And I just loved it more and more and more and more. Uh, And that's pretty much all I dive now. Yeah. And it's super interesting to me because I'm looking at side mount rebreathers right now. I'm a side mount diver through and through, and I don't really want to go to back mount. And I'd looked at the sidewinder and thought that it was kind of a recreational unit. And maybe sometimes you base things on the side of the pack, size of the package. And I was talking to Mike Thomas, who I know is trained with you on the sidewinder. Mm-hmm. And Mike said, no, this unit, and I use it and it's, it's fantastic. So I started doing some research and the video and the comments from students and, and divers using the sidewinder is really, really compelling. And for someone like me, you know, the things I don't want to give up from my open circuit experience is the balance, the trim, the stability that I have in that and, and worker breathing is always an issue. So to talk us through some more your, your thoughts on that with respect to the sidewinder. Well, that's one of the things that I liked most about it um, is obviously at first I was the only one diving it. Um, uh, and when it was ready to go to the market, I think it came out in February of 16, 17, February of 17. Um, I did the first class in December of 2016 on what might call the beta production model. So it was, we think this is how we're going to put it out. Tell us if you want us to change anything. Cause I came up with the back plates that fit most of the, you know, that fit all the different harnesses. Um, mm-hmm. I came up with the coupling system that, uh, that clips it on. Um, I had come up with an idea. I sent it to, I pitched it to Mike. It was kind of complex and convoluted and he built this uh, cage to go around it, to hook it on. And mm-hmm. it's all made out of TIG welded stainless and it's such <laughs> a work of art. I need it hanging on the wall. But yeah. then I one dive and I went, yeah, this is terrible. Um, and then I went back to hose clamps and bolt snaps and, you know, yeah, yeah. keep it simple. Yeah. And um, anyway, so from cleaned parts to done and on the trailer or on the truck tailgate uh, is about 16 minutes. So that's scrubbers wow. pack, linearity checks, done, everything ready to go. Um, but the balance and trim, when I do tri dives for people, uh, um, a lot of rebreathers, have a big learning curve and buoyancy is, is difficult. This thing, I mean, I had, I had people, um, I've got hundreds and hundreds of pictures of people. Um, one girl, friend of, friend of, uh, my, uh, her girlfriend of my dive partner, uh, she probably only had 40 or 50 dives out of cave class. And mm-hmm. uh, I put her in the thing and she looked like she'd been diving it for years, uh, in the first minute. So it trims out so nicely if it's put together properly, I have right. seen a lot of people lately that uh, I'm not real certain about 
how they were tied to, to set them up, but um, it, it, they're super tight. Um, anything my chest will fit through, I can go through. Um, mm-hmm. One friend of mine early on, I don't think it was out to the public yet. He does a lot of uh, exploration with me. Um, he was diving a homemade rebreather and then an, a Revo. And he was looking for something side mount, but he wasn't sure what he wanted. And there's an exploration here in the mill pond and there's a restriction that only two of us have been through and it's about eight or nine inches tall. My head barely fits through. I got to turn my head sideways most of the time. Mm -hmm. And I'm gearing up one day and he had just done some survey back there and he goes back there open circuit. And he said, where are you going? And I told him and he said, well, you, you can't fit through that restriction in that. I said, you know, Everybody says that, and I'm tired of hearing it. And I said, so I'm just going to take a camera. I'm going to hold it out here, and, and we'll see. And one of my students, or former students, was sitting at the picnic table working on his laptop, and he looked at me, and he goes, wait a minute. Let me get this straight. You're going to go 9,000 feet back through a restriction that everybody on the planet says you can't make it through by yourself. And I said, yes. And he goes, what if you're wrong? I said, well, then I'll have a bad day. Mm-hmm. He goes, you're going to die? I said, no, I'm not going to die. I said, I've got plenty of open circuit bail out with me. I said, it's, you know, it'll just be a long open circuit swim out. And so I did. And I ended up taking that selfie footage. And a buddy of mine here at work, he put it together in a little video that's on the Cave Adventure Facebook page called Eight Inches of Fun. Anyway, when I got back, Jason Richards looked at that raw footage and he goes, I'll take two. And so he bought him and his wife one right there on the spot. So. That's phenomenal. And look, I'm an X deep diver as well. And they're very kindly a sponsor of my podcast, but you've made some really cool mods to the stealth 2.0 tech system from what I can see. Can you tell us about those? Sure. Um, I, I, I like the stealth a lot. The problem is with the sidewinder, probably it's, it's only major drawback is you can't reach behind you because those cans sit right up there on top of your tanks. Right. So you clip reels on your back D-ring to your, to your uh, crotch strap, like a lot of people do, mm-hmm. you, you, it's really difficult to reach. Um, so the rear dump uh, on the X-Deep was nearly impossible to reach. So originally, I put a tube all the way up through, and it came out the top and then down the shoulder, and mm-hmm. it dumped like all, you know, I've been, I've been doing that to harnesses since before there was side mount harnesses when we were building our own. Um, <clears throat> So it was right where I expected to be. And the problem was once I got it done, it was such a long uh, tube down to get there and so many bends that you couldn't hardly pull it hard enough Mm -hmm. to, in fact, Brian had said he had tried that on his uh, stealth tech. And he said, you just can't pull it hard enough. Well, we came up with a little uh, line stop ball and that acts as a lever on the end. And now I can just reach up here with my pinky. So that worked out really well. Then when I was talking to Peter from uh, X-Deep at one of the DEMA shows, <clears throat> Brian was there with me and we were talking about the being able to remotely dump. And so I had asked him if he could put a dump up here uh, on the inside. And I showed him where I thought a good location was. The next year at DEMA, he had one where it came out the side instead Mm -hmm. and it wasn't what I wanted up here, but he said he tried it. Um, He's supposed to be sending that one to me. Um, Hopefully we'll see that soon. But the one out the side really worked out pretty well. We did um, uh, done a lot of work on that. I've done probably seven or eight of them so far. Um, It's getting, all the little things that make it work. So how do you mm-hmm. keep that thing from moving? How do you keep it from getting hung up? So mm-hmm. um, I've got a guy that works for me. Uh, I taught him to modify stuff years ago when he first came to work for me. And uh, he, he's got just a natural engineering type brain. And so whenever we look at a problem together, he comes up with eight solutions, you know, a minute. Mm-hmm. So um, so anyway, we've, we've come up with this, um, and it really, if you've got anything more than just a small amount of gas in it, it dumps quite nicely. If you get down to the very last little bit of gas, you do have to have a, a slight uh, left side down tip to get that last little bit of gas. But it really works very nicely. 
Yeah, and that makes sense based on the location of that dump anyhow. You know, I mean, you're going to have to have, I guess, the same thing. If there was a top dump, you'd have to be a little bit head up, wouldn't you? Yeah. Well, you know, Brian, he couldn't reach his even without a sidewinder on. (laughs) So He he talked about his short arms when he was on the show (laughs) with me. (laughs) Yeah, he he does. So he would have to – and. You know, I dive with him quite frequently, yeah. and he would crank to about a seventy-degree list yeah. uh, to get that gas out of there. And so, anyway, I think he's going to really like uh, <clears throat> the side dump. It really works nice. Oh, very cool. Well, good to know that um, we can modify the system that we're using already for the sidewinder. Now, I, when I spoke to Mike Thomas, and also when I read this, when I read the specs on the sidewinder, it mentions in there uh, because it's in two canisters. Uh, that it's not as well suited to cold water. But I know for a fact that Mike's diving in pretty cold water. So what, where is the kind of limit, you know, with the sidewinder around water temperature and so on? Or is there actually a limit? Well, you know how SORB works. So uh, mm-hmm. the colder the water, the less efficient. Um, it's basically how do you keep those cans warm? So um, when I did Mike's class for him we did it in france in around 48 49 degree water Mm -hmm. so uh, we were doing you know three plus hour dives um and i had no problems uh ever since i got the uh sidewinder project every time i hear that there's a problem then i'll push that to see how far i can take it um Mm -hmm. uh, early on it was uh uh, you get any water in it you're gonna die so I flooded that thing numerous, numerous times, putting more and more and more water into it, and it just never became a problem. We eventually made a dumpable counter lung. Uh, once anybody dives it for very long, they realize they don't need it. But with the cold, uh, a friend of mine was diving my unit up in Canada in 39 degree water, and you know, like I said, I said, well, what's the longest dive you did, Mike? And he goes, it's 39 degrees, Ed. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> how long, exactly. How long can I stay here? So, yeah. you know, it's still, it's still good for several hours, um, even in 39 degree water. And I'm not good for th- several hours in 39 degree no, water. No, no, no. But now they make, have... the, Go ahead, man. They, they make the syntactic foam, um, which keeps the heat in. Um, and if yep. you're going to dive really, really cold, they have the heated canisters now. So um, there's, cool. there's virtually no cold issues whatsoever. Okay, well, let's push the other limit. So the sidewinder is rated to 91 meters, 300 feet. Um, how does it perform for trimix dives? Excellent. Um, um, I don't do deep much anymore. Um, I've only had it to about 310. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it, the, the work of breathing is phenomenal. Um, it performs phenomenally. It's just a great unit. Um, the... The reason that it has a depth rating at all is because it's got the blocked orifice, mm-hmm. not because it's going to implode. Um, so I'm running mine with the, with the adjustable needle valve, and mm-hmm. so it pretty much has no depth limit. So um, I, you know, I'm getting old, so I don't have the burning desire to go four, <laughs> five, six anymore. No, no, <laughs> I get no, bored no. on that much, Nico, but... Yeah, um, yeah. I, but if I needed to go there, um, I would have no worries, no concerns at all taking the thing to three or 400, 500 feet. That, that's super interesting. And that, that needle valve you spoke about was the new one that came out for the sidekick as well, right? Yes. Well, it's not out yet. It's still in an experimental phase. Um, right. um, Mike usually makes them, gives them to me, Brian, mm-hmm. a couple other, um, they will be, um, available soon to the public, but I think it's going to be a, you have to be recommended by somebody like Brian or myself, um, right. to get one. So right. Mike's just concerned that the, the whole it's feeding you, your metabolic rate now is gone. And are you going to be smart enough to, to watch yeah. your PO2? So, yeah, yeah, no, I hear you. I hear you. So what, what's interesting to me now is the contrast between the sidekick and the sidewinder. So where does one come into play versus the other, or is it more, what do you feel more comfortable with? Well, it's an excellent question. Um, I, I love my Liberty. I love my sidekick. Um, uh, I enjoyed the, um, all of them really. But when you have a unit on your side, 
Uh, if you're going to do something with small restrictions, which I do on a near daily basis, um, where just the width of my chest is all I can get through there. Mm -hmm. um, the one advantage to the side mountable unit, Sidekick, Sidewinder, or uh, Sidekick, Liberty, Flex, SF2, is you can take it off, put it in front of you mm -hmm. um, to do a really, really small restriction. But the downfall is you only have one bottle. So since all I do is cave dive, um, you know, you, redundancy is key. So mm -hmm. you've got to carry stage bottles and you've got to drop them or more stuff to feed through the holes. Um, when I'm doing my side winder, most of the time I'm diving it, unless I'm doing, you know, deep, deep trimix dives, um, I'm diving it with little LP50s. They're super small. My profile right. is nothing. Um, and I, re I have redundancy and I can carry stages. So um, the, your trim and balance that you spoke about mm -hmm. is quite different with the side mounted rigs um, yeah. and some of them more so than others. Uh, also your uh, work of breathing when you get out of horizontal trim um, is worse on some more than others. Um, but uh, the, the balance and the comfort and the, um, the familiarity that you already have with side mount is all there. All you've done right. is added 25 pounds of, uh, Rebreather. Right, right. So you teach uh, all of the Sidewinder courses, Sidekick courses, and, and others as well. What would someone expect from coming on a Sidewinder course with you? Well, it depends on if they're doing a crossover or if they're doing a full class. Um, so all of my classes, I teach the why behind the how. So I'm never going to teach you how to do something without thoroughly explaining why. Because in mm -hmm. my opinion, knowing the why is more important than the how. Sure. So um, <clears throat> we're going to, the main thing is um, I don't want to just teach you how to dive a rebreather. I want to teach you how that thing is working, how everything functions, and I want you to become in tune with the machine so it becomes part of you. So anything that, because we all know everything man-made, it's not a matter of if something is going to break, it's, it's when it breaks and where are you going to be when that happens. Sure. So if you're extremely comfortable with, with how everything's working, why it does that, and all the scenarios, um, I, I teach, think of this as a flow chart. Yep. Ed is supposed to feel like this. Does he? If yes, continue on. If no, move to the no box. Um, so we do, we attack every single aspect exactly that way so that when something happens for real, it's just kind of a, ah, well, that sucks. Here's what I'm going to do. There should never be that ah! moment of yeah. uh, sheer panic. It's just, hmm, well, that sucks. Here's what we're going to do. So yep. that's, that's what they should do. Yeah, now that sounds awesome. It sounds like a very similar thought process to your problem solving that you apply to rescues or recoveries. Right. I, I always, it's, it's, I don't want to make a diver, a, a, mem a memorizing diver. I want to make a thinking diver. Yeah. So I don't want you to go over charts and uh, X times three, uh, what was that formula again? I want you to be able to think on the fly. Everything should be done just that quick and on the fly. Yeah, and I guess there's, a, 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 there's an obvious answer to my next question, but I'm interested in the progression from starting out on one of these units through to taking it into an overhead environment and taking it to depth. How, how do you approach that? Well, um, how do I approach it or how do I recommend they approach it? Um, I, it's like anything else. For one, you need to get proper training know the why behind the how, get familiar with that machine, and then it's just a simple matter of you need to put hours on it. How yeah. many hours a week, how many hours a month can you do if it's going to sit there for a while? So you need to get your hours on it. And then if uh, for those 99% uh, of the ones that I've taught um, on this rebreather, on any of the rebreathers, they're all cave divers. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> then when you're really comfortable – then we're going to go into a cave CCR crossover. And pretty much all I need to see is can you do every skill we just did in cave class, but now in a rebreather. Right, right. 
yeah, makes sense. And the building hours is really important, isn't it? Yeah. And, you know, just like everything else, clear back from the five rules of cave diving, you know, don't go above your training. So yeah. if you just got certified on the unit yesterday, we're not going to go on a 5,000 foot cave dive today. Mm -hmm. so, <clears throat> think about, you know, uh, where can I go just to, it's going to be simple, easy, and I can just have fun and get used to this machine. You've been listening to Speaking Sidemount from www.sidemountpros.com. If you'd like the podcast, please subscribe and consider leaving us a five-star review. If there's something you'd like us to cover on the show, then let us know via our Facebook page listed in the podcast notes. Thanks again, and we look forward to you joining us on our next episode of Speaking Sidemount.